Thanks for stopping in at Down the Road Show. Today we're talking about Star Trek Picard, and I'm extremely excited because first we're going to talk to our friend Gil Barron, and we're going to talk about what to expect, hopefully, from the first episode of Picard. Then we're going to get some spoilers while we talk to our friend Nathan Adams about the actual first episode of Picard. So I'm excited to talk to both these Trekkies. I love Star Trek, but I am in no way a Trekkie. I cannot retain that much knowledge. So I bow down to all you Trekkies out there, but let's get started. All right, thanks for checking back in with Down the Road Show. I am here with my friend, Gil. He's a comedy producer. How are you doing today, Gil? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be talking to you. I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. I have been since I was nine years old, and there's nothing I like talking about more. Heck yeah, I can't wait to get into uh, your uh, predictions and what you're going to be looking for and uh, mm -hmm. excited about with Picard, especially that. But first, let's talk about what you do, my brother. Uh, you got your own show. So thank you very much for taking time to be on, on my show. But let's talk about your show real quick. Uh, what's the name of it again? It's called Your Late Night Show Tonight. Your so it's a live night. talk show. It's a live late night show here in LA, in Hollywood. We do it at the PAC Theater. And the PAC Theater is great. It's the, the fastest It's the fastest growing uh, comedy theater. It's like UCB or like Groundlings was. Um, it's the fastest growing one in LA and has basically the incubator for so much amazing talent. So and and unlike, right. unlike this show, people can actually mm. go and attend and watch a live taping. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't know yet, right? This is a brand new venture, so I'm sure it's going to be the destination for all people, right? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, and we like to keep our thumb on the pulse of what's cool in Hollywood and L.A., but what, what, what really fascinates me about uh, the concept behind your show is a rotating host. Yeah, yeah. Every single month we have a different host hosting their own talk show in their own voice. It's all about their point of view, their comedy, who they are. So we've had people like Jade Catapretta, who's the new host of The Soup. We've had Colton Dunn from Superstore. We've had Matt Pinfield, who you remember from MTV News from 120 Minutes. Um, and this month we have an incredibly special guest. If you guys are in LA, in Hollywood on February 14th, on Valentine's Day, our show is gonna be hosted by the lead guitarist of NoFX, El Jefe. That's dope. It's going to be amazing. Last night, we just went through our pitches. Um, so I can tell you that there's going to be amazing surprises. And the, the people he wants to get as guests on it for him to interview are mind-blowing. I'm just, I'm, I couldn't be more excited. That's awesome. So whether you celebrate Valentine's and your lover, or if it's a singles awareness party, That's that right. sounds like the place to be for sure. Yeah, especially if you like punk rock and Valentine's Day put together. Oh, come on. I'm a bleeding heart, and I love loud music. Yeah. And those are the two things. Those are the two requirements. Excellent, excellent. You got any, you got any ideas on future hosts that you're trying to get? Yes. Yes, we do have ideas about future hosts. Can we anyway. talk about those? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to, I don't want to, God forbid, make a promise, and then people are like, wait a minute, that right. person didn't show up. <clears throat> right, right. What we've been right. doing for close to four years, so... Oh. And not taking a single month off. So every single month, we've had an incredible comedian host and people that you know from Comedy Central and Conan and, and network TV. So, you know, it's my favorite thing that I do. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's, uh, we'll get more updates from you in the future about future guests once you can finally announce those and updates yeah. about how the show went. And hopefully we'll get some feedback from our fans out there about your guys' show. But let's get into some Picard because you're, uh, I've been reading every single one of your Facebook posts as you've been getting ready for this Star Trek show and this new spinoff of one of my personal favorite captains. I know we all got our favorite captains, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what kind of projections, what, what kind of feels are you expecting out of this show personally as a fan and as a, as a writer? Yeah, I mean, as a writer, as someone who kind of has seen what CBS has been doing <clears throat> with these new Star Trek shows, and I really like Discovery. I think Discovery is wonderful. They do have a very particular aesthetic tone and rhythm to it, right? Right. Like it's, very, it's very frenetic. Sometimes you don't even have a chance to uh, 
to think about what's happening before you realize what just happened. Like things come at you really fast on discovery. Right. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I know, I know the pacing upset a lot of fans out there online. I don't think they were wrong. And I don't, you know, I would, I don't get upset about these things, but I don't think they were wrong about the pacing. I think it's a valid criticism. And so that's my general, so I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I know that Patrick Stewart had a stronger um, creative hand in the making of Picard. Yes. And so <clears throat> I think my main worry about that in particular is remember, he had a stronger creative hand in the making of Nemesis. Okay. I don't think people remember that as part of the, the, the press around it. People were talking about, oh, John Logan is making this movie. And by the way, John Logan is such close friends with, with Brent Spiner and Patrick Stewart that they basically had a hand in writing the whole thing. So I think that what we've seen from between TV Picard, Next Generation Picard, and movie Picard is we've seen the difference between, you know, cerebral Picard and action hero Picard. Yes. And I think action hero Picard for many years was what Patrick Stewart wanted. Gotcha. So I think he really wanted to, you know, I mean, the guy was in his 60s and had biceps like I'm never going to have in my whole life. So... So getting him shirtless a couple of times, he was like, yeah, show, show my arms, man. And uh, that's a direct, that's my impression of Patrick Stewart, by the way. <laughs> hey, bro. So, so are you looking, you're looking more, now that he's older, getting back to that cerebral Captain Blue? <clears throat> that's, that's my thinking. <clears throat> like, look, it's 20 years since Nemesis. Right. If he hasn't learned those lessons by now, you know, he's not going to learn them. So... I think it's 20 years later. Um, he's an older guy. Maybe he, he thinks of Picard as more cerebral, but just those factors, just the fact that action Picard seems to be more of what Patrick Stewart was interested in while making those movies, and also the fact that the CBS All Access shows the pacing and the energy is very in your face and frenetic. That makes me just cautiously optimistic, but I, but I, I am on the optimistic side. For me, I don't, for a long time I was saying, you know, my mantra would be, I don't have a critical eye for Star Trek. I can't tell when something's good or bad because I've just loved it for so long that I just watch it and I'm like, yes, just, it's just me spending time with my friends, you know, like I don't care what you guys are giving me, just give it to me. Yeah, As that's me. That's me in Star Wars, and my general sure. role is entertain me because as a 45-year-old nerd, the yeah. kind of content that we're getting, I never imagined as a child that we would be able to get in my entire lifetime. Yeah, so okay. even, even when there's plot holes or some suspect CGI or whatever, I'm still just a giant man-child going, woo! I'll tell you, I rarely worry about plot holes. Again, I've been producing in Hollywood a long time. I was in development uh, at different networks and studios. I've worked with writers for many, many years. So when I look at story, my main and overriding and over, over, like my biggest concern is always emotion and theme. So is it going to make me feel something? And I will say that on Discovery's, on the plus, plus side of Discovery, it does always make me feel something. And I do appreciate that. Like, they really go for the pathos. And uh, I know it's a different creative team, you know, to some extent. Um, but I am expecting that here. Right, right. That, that's what I'm hoping for. And, and you know, as, as both a Star Trek and Star Wars lover, that's one of the things I love about both those franchises is there is going to be some sort of lesson involved. Uh, they go about it in completely different ways where I've always looked at Star Trek as kind of a spirituality kind of sense. You get those lessons on that. Uh, you know, maybe, yeah, some morality and all that, that kind of stuff. But whereas in Star Trek, it's definitely your cerebral, scientific, yeah. you know, let's think things through with compassion and empathy as, yeah. you know, as well. Those lessons are still there, but in a much more cerebral way. So in terms of plot, where are you at? Do you, do you have your predictions already in terms of what the plot is going to be? Because I think, I think that I, I, trailer was fairly clear. I think, I think, I think it's going to, I think they're going to, they're going to use time. Time is the most easy manipulated uh, 
plot point in today's cinema and TV because people don't understand it, both as a concept, as a watcher or a writer. So it's easy to just write your own version of how time works. So that way they can manipulate and utilize different characters from different Star Treks being, sure. you know, this could be Patrick Stewart's last hurrah. This could be his last his last time being being the captain. So why not utilize as many characters for, that are beloved, you know, because yeah. you got seven of nine coming in. So why not use as many characters that are beloved as possible? And the only way to do that is using multiverse, multidimensional and time in your plot. Oh my God, I would hate that. <laughs> that would that would be nothing like anything I would want. I'm one of those rare people, you know, that I, I that end game just, uh, fell so flat for me you know after the beauty of infinity war i thought infinity war was a perfect film and then when we got into endgame and we were in the multiverse and we were in uh multiple timelines i checked out immediately because i'm like where are the stakes right yeah and 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 i get that and that's where me personally i'm fascinated by you know tv shows and anything revolving around time and multiverse because there's so many different ways to portray it and you know, scientifically, we don't even know the right way. So yeah. we scientifically, they agree that it exists, and that in itself is a fascinating concept. But yeah, you're right. In in entertainment, it it can be it can be an overused trope, or what's the word I'm looking for? You know, well, they only used it the one time in Avengers, and when they used it, to me, that that it it, pull, it let all the air out of the out of the tires. It just Everything just lost the like, momentum. Oh, okay. So they're going to be fine no matter what. Even even Black Widow, you know, is going to be fine at some point. You know, right? The it just seemed like there were no stakes. So I wouldn't want that in Picard. I don't know that they have been hinting at that. I feel I, like I don't think they, I don't think they are either. I'm just trying to. I, it just seems like a popular area to go to. It these is a popular days. area. So well, I definitely see. I, I think that's an easy. Work. I think that's just an easy fallback. And you're right. I'm kind of with you. I hope they don't do that. But in my thinking, in the way Hollywood has been pumping stuff out lately, that might be a route they might go. I'm not saying I want that. I'm just saying that might be. Yeah, I mean, the, anything is possible, right? I mean, they certainly went to that well again with Discovery when they went to the Mirror Universe. And the Mirror Universe, like I look, Mirror Mirror from the original series is one of my favorite episodes. I love that episode of television, but the more times they go back to the mirror universe, the less it makes sense. Right. To me. Okay. Because how can it be a mirror universe if the paths of the characters diverge like that? So then it really isn't a mirror universe, it's just an alternate universe. And you shouldn't Correct. worry about, oh, someone being the exact opposite. It doesn't, it just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And I think that's fine um, because one of the great things about the original series is that it was like, let's bring in this science fiction concept and we'll explore this concept. And that's one of the things I love. Um, but yeah, but what I've seen from Picard, everything seems to be about following up with the Borg and sort of survivors of the Borg. Um, I mean, that's, that's the commonality between Picard and Seven of Nine, right? Is that they're both survivors of the Borg and certainly with Hugh, who we know is in the series. Um, and a lot of the images from the trailers seem to be about, you know, former Borg, uh, Borg colonists, people taking apart Borg. So are you, uh, are you one of the book readers? Have you read the pocketbook series? I, have, well, I used to be a book reader. I've not read any books in forever because my eyes just don't allow it anymore. And I sure. just get too tired brain wise. So uh, I'm going to start audible uh, soon and start listening to more books. I love it. But by uh, the way, you know, you know that the public library has audiobooks as well. So they have a couple of apps. They have Libby and Overdrive, which are two apps that you can uh, get books for free. And so you don't have to be paying an audible subscription. Oh, okay. Interesting to know. Uh, Interesting to I'll know. keep that in mind, depending on whether Audible actually, you know, sponsors this podcast or not. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the trailer but, for, where was I? Oh, oh so no, no, I was no, saying the books. So I, I feel very clearly they're going to disregard all of the post Deep Space Nine, post Voyager uh, Star Trek novels. Mm -hmm. That seems like a given, you know, all of those great stories are gonna, not gonna be in, in continuity and that's perfectly fine. Um, but a few years ago, they 
uh, were able to destroy the Borg uh, in the in the book series. The Borg finally made their big, big push, and all of the casts of all the Star Trek series got together. We discovered the origins of the Borg, where they came from. So the Borg were officially destroyed. So let's say theoretically. I'm with you. I know it's not going to happen. Let's say theoretically they decide to use that as continuity. Not going to happen. But let's say they do. And this is... 10 years later, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have things like um, former survivors of the Borg just being out there uh, ready to come back to their homes and their families. You have derelict Borg cubes like we saw in the, um, that, the that the Romulans were to towing in the trailer. Right. They had those shields, you know, kind of filling in the gaps of the Borg cube. I think all of that would track um, if the board had been destroyed. Right, 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 right. And actually, here's where, now that you're bringing that up, okay, here's actually kind of where I think they might be going with this, and which I, I kind of hope so, which would, be, which would be great, because as someone who has dealt with PTSD and have lots of friends who have dealt with PTSD, uh, I'm currently watching, I'm, I'm re-watching The Next Generation right now, and I'm on, I just started the season after Picard got his first abduction with the Borg and yeah. that those first few episodes are him dealing with PTSD. Like that kind of stuff wasn't talked about on TV back then in the day. So now if they can have an entire society dealing with that and showing that like, that's a huge storyline. That's a huge life lesson that people out there in television land need to see and deal with because a lot of people are dealing with things that they don't feel they have, can talk to somebody else about mental health. Yeah, baby. I think that's clearly going to be a part of the show. You know, it was certainly, a, it was a part of First Contact. And I think that the general um, wisdom is that that was the best of the next generation Star Trek movies. And I think people um, know that that was part of it, that it had that kind of, uh, that kind of pathos and was going back to the well of what Picard was feeling about that stuff. And I think that from the trailers that we've seen from Picard, there was one line that really struck out to me or stuck out to me, and that was um, someone. So Picard says something like, "I've I've lived more lives than uh -huh. you can imagine," or "I've lived many lives," something like that. Do you remember that line? Yes, yes, yes. And which is why I was like, "Oh, maybe they're going to be delving into time and multidimensional theory." Yeah, I don't. That's that's not what that spoke to me of. That, it spoke to me of um, first of all him becoming Locutus of Borg, right. but also the um, the episode. Uh, why am I forgetting the where he becomes the guy where he lives that guy's life for a whole the inner life? Oh yeah, you know, where, he, where he lives that guy's whole lifetime and comes back and then is Picard again. Right. So there are so many moments and even even all good things, right? The finale of Star Trek: The Next Generation, where he now remembers living all the way to age seventy or eighty years old and getting that uh, degenerative de uh, brain disorder. Oh, um, spoiler alert, jerk. I didn't, I'm only yeah. on season four. <laughs> no, he gets eromotic syndrome, I believe is what we called it. In, uh, but yeah, yeah, on, on, a, on, a deeper, on a deeper level. Yeah, you're exactly right. And he has, so lived he has literally lives. lived many lives. He's lived many versions of his own life. He even had the chance, you know, with Q to go back to his own youth and relive the the circumstances that made him get a pacemaker, right? Oh, Q, my favorite jerk of television ever. Look, they already picked it up for season two. We know that we're gonna we're gonna see a Picard season two. Yes, uh, I would love to see Q in Picard two. That's what I would hope for. Absolutely. I want to see I want to see Captain Worf. You know, I want Worf uh, commanding his own ship. I want. Uh, I'm want, sure Michael Doran yeah. agrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a Captain Worf stan. I got to meet uh, Michael Doran at the Improv not that long ago. Oh, he nice. Was at, he was at the Hollywood Improv doing um, Stephen Kramer Glickman's show. Oh, okay. Well, guess who's going to be a guest in a couple months uh, when he's getting ready to promote his new album? Stephen. I love Damn Stephen. right. Yeah. Big fan of Stephen. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Funny man, funny man, and just super. It's going to be a good show. Nice. I'm going to tune yeah. in for that one. Yeah, that'll be fun. Well, hopefully by then you'll have more stuff to promote and you'll have a new host. I, I always have stuff to promote. I, every single day of my life, I have something. We're already gearing up for the next Pac Chella. 
Pacchella is the comedy music festival that I produce every year uh, that we've had, you know, Rachel, Blo Rachel Bloom and Jackie Tone and, uh, and Luke Null and all of the greatest musical comedians in LA come and do this festival every year. So uh, that's going to be at the end of May. Well, that, okay. That sounds awesome. And for everybody out there watching this podcast on YouTube right now, you can find all of Gil's information with everything he's been talking about down in the information under his name, along with everybody else's information that's been in this podcast. But yeah. Gil, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you on Instagram and Twitter? Sure. On Instagram and Twitter, I am at GJ Barron. That's Gil J. Barron. So it's GJ Barron. Um, you can also follow my shows at your late night, at your late night. So you'll find that on, on both Instagram and Twitter. Awesome, brother. Well, wonderful catching up with you. You're one of my Wait, favorite. Do you want to people. talk about what episodes of Star Trek we have to watch to prepare? I have so much more to talk about. We can talk about whatever you want, bro. We have to keep going. We can't end this like this. We have so much more. <sighs> what? <Sorry>. Else? <laughs> that was so, a, why weren't you in this intense the entire time? <laughs> I'm so excited about Picard because we have not because, like I said, I'm a book reader. I'm reading all the books. I know what's going on with you know, on Cardassia with the rebuilding of Cardassia, all that stuff is going on in the books, you know? I, and and uh, look, I'm friends with Doug Jones, but because I haven't, I'm disabled and I haven't worked in three years, I haven't watched Discovery yet. So when I pay to watch Picard, I'm going to be binging Discovery at the same time. So that way- That's the smart way to do it. You got to binge yeah. both seasons. Yeah. But yeah. So now you'll be able to join the chorus of the people who are like, the pacing's a little weird. Yeah. And that's well, and people were just like, well, jump on the CBS app and download it. What's your problem? I'm like, my problem is I'm disabled and literally I'm fighting social security currently to get disabled money. I'm on food stamps and I haven't worked in three years. And if it wasn't for my sister paying the rent and allowing me to live here and do this fucking podcast, I'd be going fucking mentally goddamn crazy right now. <laughs> You'd be as intense as I am. Yeah, more so. More so, more so, yeah. Um, yes, but there's some other like materials that we kind of need to prep to get into Picard, right? Right. Because there's all the great episodes of Next Gen. I, I made a whole list of them. Yeah, that's and favorite. that's and that's what I was talking about on your Facebook post, like that whole yeah. list of like these are the important episodes, blah 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 blah. Yeah, do which you want me why, to bring it up right now? Which is why I'm currently binging Next Generation to, because it's been. I haven't watched it since it was on TV, to be honest. So since yeah. it's on Netflix, like I started in the beginning of 2019, uh, before I switched to Cheers and Parks and Rec and finished those series because that's just good old TV that I love and forgot which, what really good series endings those had. Because like, if you think about how many, you know, Game of Thrones, uh, Lost, modern day television, so many series endings people have hated. Like, that's true. Think I of think, a modern day series ending that you've enjoyed. Can, can you name one? Oh, Parks and Rec. There we go. Parks and Rec was a great ending. And I forgot what a great ending Cheers had. Like, that Cheers was had a pretty good ending. Really yeah. good ending. But, <clears throat> and, but I forgot how the next generation ended. So that's another reason I'm trying to binge that and catch up so I can refresh myself. Oh, that's a perfect day. ending. Remind um, me. It's, it's just once, I mean, it's all good things is the last episode. But what so, happened in that episode? Remind me. So All Good Things finds Picard bouncing forward and backwards in time. Like Slaughterhouse-Five, he's become unstuck in time. Oh, I and, fucking love that book. Yeah, and in all three timelines that he's bouncing between, there is a spatial anomaly going on in a faraway system that's in the neutral zone. So, in, so he realizes this is in all three timelines, including in the past, which he doesn't remember there ever being this anomaly. So he has to get all three crews to that time. And obviously the current time, he can tell them everything that's going on, everyone's on board. In the past, he has to keep it a secret why they have to go there. In the future, everyone thinks that he has this degenerative, degenerative brain disease and that he's going crazy. And so that's the, the rub of it. And what we find out is that this is a final test by Q who showed up in the first episode and telling Picard that uh, humanity is on trial and that Picard is essentially the representative of humanity, right? 
So we find out that this is a big test by Q, uh, and it really ties together the entire series. It ties together all of Picard's relationships, and it ends on one of the most beautiful notes uh, about the relationships between the characters of the series, because that, I think, even when Star Trek The Next Generation can be goofy or can be, you know, um, too cerebral for its own good or not follow up on things or too episodic, I think the thing that ties that show together and makes people love it are the relationships between the characters, because you can really tell that all of those actors really did love each other. Um, they were They were friends off screen, they were very close friends off screen. And that's what really translated onto the series. And the series finale is really like a celebration of that. And that's one of the things I love most about it. I invite you to look through the Down the Road Show YouTube channel for yeah. my Next Generation reunion panel that yeah. was in Phoenix, Arizona. Go through the comments section. Okay. Is, is that... Uh, Showing that what I'm saying is wrong? Were they not super good friends with, with each other? Let's just say all but one. Okay. <laughs> all right. I know Brent Spiner can be a dick. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> is that not the one? Nope. He's a lovely treasure of a man. <laughs> let's just, um, but let's yeah, just... The other thing I wanted to bring up, besides going back and rewatching the series, of course, and there yes. are specific episodes that relate to the Borg and relate to the Romulans that I think are important to see, and even episodes of Voyager that we should check out, because we know Seven is going to be part of it, and we know the survivors of the Borg are going to be a part of it. Right. So I would actually, I would be really surprised if we didn't hear an update on what happened to Icheb and all of those Borg children that were in Star Trek Voyager. Right. I don't know if you remember that Voyager was able to rescue a group of children who were uh, assimilated Borg and uh and deborgify them and make them residents of voyager and they all came back to earth with seven and she became kind of their mother hen throughout that series so there's uh there's a few episodes of that that are i think going to be relevant to picard i also am reading the picard countdown comic book are you are you reading that yet do you know what no the plot is? no what what please so just to prepare what the fuck people, is that <laughs> Well, you know, what they've done with IDW, IDW is the comic book company that has the license. Yes, I love IDW. We love you, IDW. Yeah, they have the license for all of Star Trek. And what they do, um, you know, before any of these big shows, is they'll put out a countdown series, which is essentially what you need to know going into it. Okay. Right? So before Star Trek 2009, they did the prequel comic book countdown that told you about Nero and where Nero came from and, and about Spock's mission to save Romulus at that time. Hmm, okay. Which, okay. by the way, is also going to be a plot point in Picard. So if Good, because I, li I like the new Star Trek, so I don't give a crap what anyone said. I like yeah, those I like movies. Them, I, think, I like the casting. I think Beyond is a really good movie. It's another one of those movies that talks about the relationships between the characters, and that's what I really love about Beyond. Um, sorry. No, 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 no. Drink up. Hydration is important. We talk about that all the time at Down the Road Show because I don't know how many conventions I've been to where all of a sudden I realize that nine o'clock at night as I'm leaving the convention, I have a sip yet. of water all day. <laughs> I haven't eaten. All I've been doing is running around filming with my camera for everybody, doing their panels, and then them bugging me for 48 hours. Where's my panel? Where's my panel? It takes a while to edit and upload to Facebook. I mean, to YouTube, goddammit. So what they did is they told you the whole story of how Spock tried to save Romulus and failed. So anyone who's a completist and wants to know like exactly what happened with the destruction of Romulus, which is in current continuity, it's not just in J.J. Abrams continuity, it, that is in prime timeline continuity. We've oh, never seen it on screen okay. before, but that is going to be part of Star Trek Picard, the destruction of Romulus. So, so, so do I, you think answering stuff like that is just fan serving or is that actually serving the overall story? I think it's serving the story. For me, it was important to know. I Because what I felt in, t in 2009, I appreciated that, he, that JJ had a story to tell and all that stuff was background, so didn't necessarily have to tell that story in full. But I also appreciated that there was a place I could go to find that out and learn about Nero and Nero's wife and who he was and how Spock tried to save Romulus. And in that series, you find out that Picard, Geordi, and Data were all involved in trying to save Romulus as well. 
okay. and they all failed together. So that can that if if that's sorry in continuity. And Alex Kurtzman, Kurtzman was one of the writers on that comic book. He was one of the people writing it. And is so he writing on Picard? And he's the you know he's the executive producer of all of the current Star Trek. So that very well could be in continuity. Hmm. <clears throat> so that's what I'm hoping is so that's relevant. If you guys have Comicsology app or any other comics app where you can go into the archives and find star trek countdown that that mini series from 2009 i think that'll be uh, a fun thing to read to get some background and currently idw is doing picard countdown so you're learning some of the recent background before picard retired um uh, as an admiral before he retired as an admiral what happened uh with him getting trying to get people off romulus and so so these two series, they, they are a little bit in continuity conflict with each other, but at the same time, they're both obviously going to inform the world in some kind of way. So we're about halfway into the Countdown series for Picard, the, the comic book. But what it's showing us is that there was a colony world uh, of Romulans that Picard and the Enterprise F, I think it probably is, um, are trying to get the Romulans off this colony planet. And they're very, they're super ready to do it. They're trying to get these, um, these, uh, the Romulans off the planet. And what they find out is that there's an indigenous species of the planet and the Romulans don't give a fuck about them. So the Romulans are like, yeah, get all of our people off this planet. Um, but don't worry about those indigenous people because who cares about them? And so that's Picard's big conflict in this series is like, no, we obviously have to get the indigenous people off, you know, the yeah. planet's going to blow Cause, up. Because that doesn't mirror real life at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got to get these people out of the way. And yeah, I mean, that's Star Trek at its best. So uh, I'm excited to see how this miniseries ends. And I'm excited to see how it informs the TV show. And I know it's going to be like just a fun extra thing for people like me who who are readers of the comic, who are readers of the book, who are, who go back and rewatch the series, you know, people who just want to get all of the background together as it goes. But uh, I do think if, if you're one of those people like me, it's beneficial to go check out. Well, yeah, that sounds awesome. So it sound like two amazing IDW suggestions from Gil. So get out there, uh, find the back issues, find the current issues. Mm -hmm. Support your local comic book shop for sure and pre-order your Picard so that way you're ready to get all Star Trek Picard nerdy with those of us who want to do it on the Down the Road Show podcast. Gil, thanks for being here today. We look forward to having you back real soon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to come back anytime you want. Excellent. Peace, brother. We'll let you get back to your day. You are a busy man and you got a lot of projects going on. So we look forward to talking about those more. Oh, man, I have so much to tell you. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. All right. Later, brother. Peace out. Bye. See you down the road. All right. We're welcoming in our next guest. I'm excited to have my friend Nathan Adams on the show. How are you doing today, Nate? Hey, I'm doing great. How's everything going? It's going good. It's going good. Uh, Nathan and I go back into the convention scene a number of years. He has been gracious oh. enough to let me store my camera equipment with him while I'm out filming panels and different things at conventions and uh, all kinds of different conventions in California. So thank you for the years of uh, storage. Of course, you're like a brother to me, so it's not a very problem. But one of the reasons we're having you on the show is because of your Star Trek knowledge. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. You have a uh, fan base group. Let's promote that real quick. Okay, I am a part of the 1701st. Um, I was a fleet admiral there for a couple of years. I've since retired out. Uh, we do charities worldwide. We have ships all over the place. Uh, we've been working in conjunction with another group now called the USS Artemis. And we're continuing that tradition of doing charities, of uh, events. Also, our tables, if you ever see our tables in any convention that we're there, we're a safe harbor, which Absolutely. means if you're being bothered by anyone, you need to come someplace to relax or like Ken said, you just want to store your equipment a little bit. Once we get to know you, we don't have a problem with that. Just stop by, relax, have a good time. We're all about the IDIC. Yeah, and, and you guys live the Starfleet ideology in that way, 100%. Yes, we do. We accept uh, everybody. 
Yeah, so cosplay is not consent, and you guys are way above and beyond cosplay. Much like the 501st oh. with the Star Wars mm -hmm. raising money for charities, you guys do the same. How can people find your guys' group with your, through your social media and join up? Okay, the 1701st is on Facebook. You'll be able to find us really easy. Um, we also have an a Instagram account that our social media person, once I left, they're not updating it as much. But our Facebook account, our, our public page is updated all the time. So it's really easy to get a hold of us that way as well. Send a message. If you do a message, let them know you want to talk to Admiral Adams. And they'll forward it over to me. So it's not a problem. Also, we have a podcast as well, if you don't mind me plugging it a little bit. That's it's why you're here. Okay, it's Starfleet Underground. And you can find us as all one word, Starfleet Underground. Uh, we're on YouTube. And we're on SoundCloud, as well as um, iTunes, so you can find us. We actually had a little bit of a milestone the other day. Our, our second show, which talked about Picard, actually got over 1,000 views. So we're, we're quite happy with that. That's awesome. Do you see this J.J. Abrams type flair I got coming from the sun, coming from the window right now? Anyway, <laughs> I'm feeling very Star trek -y at the moment. Um, but one of the reasons we're having you on is because Picard episode one just finally aired, so the public has oh seen it. Oh, my God. So, ladies and gentlemen, he was at the premiere. He got to yeah, see the first was. three episodes. We won't go that far into it, but let's talk about, go ahead and give all the spoilers you want. Let's talk about episode one of Picard and what you thought about it being the Star Trek loving nerd that you are, my friend. Well, when it, when it came on, I was cautiously, cautiously optimistic when they went to go do it because um, I love Discovery, but a lot of haters were out there and I was worried that they were, that was going to happen again. But seeing it, um, the only way I could say is, wow, it, it, they, the production value was up there, the writing was up there, and Patrick Stewart just commands the screen when he's on. They, have, right. they surrounded him with a lot of top-notch actors. There was a lot of action in there. There was some intrigue. Um, you get a chance to find out uh, the Patrick Stewart uh, being Picard, what made him Picard to the point where he stood up, if you saw, against Starfleet. Right. Starfleet didn't want to do anything, and he's like, this is not what Starfleet represents. Yeah. So he was basically a lone wolf, a lone voice, trying to, to go ahead and do it. And he brought up Dunkirk. And we've had people actually who don't know their history wanting to know what was Dunkirk. It just went over their heads. And for those of you that may not know history, Dunkirk is a battle that happened in World War II where the British had close to 300,000 that was trapped against a hillside. And they just um, made a movie about it that was intense. It was very intense. And they were getting decimated. They had no way to rescue them. So they were going to lose a large portion of the military force. So they put out a call for every civilian ship to come and help rescue these men. So you had anybody that had something that floats went to Dunkirk to evacuate all of these soldiers. Yeah, so it's, basically, a, it's an amazing movie based on actual events. That is correct. And that's why he referred to that, because when Romulus had showed that the sun was going to supernova and destroy Romulus, uh, Picard said, we need to be able to evacuate the Romulan citizens. We need to get them out there. So he got a massive effort to get all of these ships to try to move them. And prejudices ran high. And it's like, you're trying to save Romulan lives. And he's like, no, they're lives. Yeah. And once, and once again, it's mimicking everyday life. Like Star, yes. Star Trek is always done. Yes, it does. It, it was done really well to see. Sometimes it's difficult to be the lone voice. And you get a chance to find out how he wind up retiring from Starfleet in the second episode. But it, it really, I think, uh, echoes back to Nemesis. If you wanted to get a more of an idea of how strong Picard is on his values, just watch Nemesis. And also before that, even The Measure of a Man, where he tries to prove that data is an individual and not a property. And, and so, boom, huge spoiler, Data's daughter. <laughs> Seriously. Like, Data's daughter. My like what? God. What are they going to do with that? Like, well, they gave, they gave an indication on the end of the first episode that there's another one. They're twinning, um, and it, it. So really, the one, yeah. So the one's been destroyed. There's a twin out there. So now 
that season one become, is going to be the search for her. Do they find her at the end of the season, somewhere in the middle? Like, how is all this going to go down? I'm dying. Well, the first three episodes, I guess I can give a minor spoiler. The first yeah, we'll do minor spoiler. Yep, yep. Yeah, they don't come across her on a, on a minor on, within the first three episodes. It's the end of the third episode that Picard actually finds a way to try to get to her. Gotcha. So the and other I kind episodes. Of, I kind of had a feeling the first few episodes would be him building his team. Well, trying to. Um, also, the second episode, there's a large chunk of the second episode, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think it's the third. I believe it's the second. That shows you exactly how the Mars accident happened. It, it oh, okay, really good. talks about what happened with that and, and why the so-called androids um, did what they did. Yeah, because the Trekkies so, want details. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you get a real good indication of, of what happened. Then you find out who was behind the androids doing what they did. So it was, it was really, really good. They did and, a really good intrigue on and, it. And, and look, you know, some people may not like the darkness and the grittiness and the fast-pacedness mm -hmm. of, of it, but like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm binging through Discovery right now, and that's the same thing. And uh -huh. quite frankly, I'm yeah. loving the fast-paced, dark edginess of it because in that darkness is where you truly can find light and find hope. Yeah, you can. There's always going to be glimmers of things where you have to ask yourself, um, is it worth it? Sometimes you feel like you're just a voice in the wilderness. But a lot of times that voice will wind up being echoed back by other voices. You just got to like go for it and move out of your comfort zone and, and take care of things and do it. And it sets a whole new, you figure with the discovery, if, if Burnham didn't do what she did, it didn't set into events everything that led Starfleet to be able to finally have peace with the Klaons or an easy peace during the discovery portion of it. Right, and, and be the events. Starfleet that we grew up watching and knowing. And that was the part exactly. I was not expecting Discovery to be in that early, early timeline. And like, that's like really cool. Exactly. And if you get more, if you have a CBS All Access or if you're listening to the Down the Road show out of the country, um, it'll be on Amazon as well as Netflix. You get a chance to also look at the shorts. You'll find that the shorts all usually have a tie-in to the actual episodes. Just like the Children of Mars had a tie-in of what happened during the destruction of, of Mars when Mars was attacked. That repercussion. If you have the sh uh, short of Discovery, where you had that gentleman was, was trapped on Discovery a thousand years in the future, and the ship has become sentient, and he's there on the ship by himself, and he leaves. If you look at season three premiere, that same guy is in the next season of Discovery. And then you also look at... Um, when they had when the one with Tilly, when she found that stowaway mm -hmm. and she was being the queen and became friends, she appeared on the next season. So I'm looking forward to it. I think we're going to see those little kids and children of Mars growing up. They, they're going to have to stud. They rarely ever show anything without a hook into the next season. So I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, we find out that Guinan is coming back. Oh, <sighs> Okay, I must have watched a video of Patrick Stewart on The View asking her like 10 times. Uh, and for like new Trekkies complaining about that, I don't even understand. Well, I'm not even going to get into whatever people have against that. But like their relationship in TNG was like, okay, you know I'm an empath and yeah. I'm, all, I'm all things empath. She's one of the first empaths that I saw on in entertainment that I related to. And I'm like, she's an empathic character. I know. We, when, like when they had the thing that happened with Tasha Yar uh, being in the alternate timeline. Right. Um, and just it's sometimes as an empath, you walk into a room, you say, There's, something's wrong. It, this doesn't feel right. And, and, and I so identified with that. This yeah. Well, like, well, like, like, this well, isn't right. Well, well, like today, I woke up and was like, something's wrong. The world feels broken. And then news yeah. of Kobe Bryant. So. And, and his daughter. Yeah, yeah, fuck. It's like, yeah. oh our, our hearts God. go out to the Bryant family. Oh, wow. Anyway, uh, but yeah, that's it's just, and so seeing, I'm, I'm glad they're bringing that character back. And I don't, in any kind of outrage so out there online, I do not understand whatsoever. She was such a great character from the show. No, so. you get people, you get people to actually not to be too political, but it's like, did you ever watch the original series? So a lot uh, yeah. of the stuff on the original series was political, like right. let this be your last battleground. 
where you had two people who basically decimated the race because one happens to be white on the wrong side. It, it, name any kind you of know? Star Trek, Voyager, the originals, yes. Deep Space Nine, they all political, yep. they all racial, they all walk that line. Yeah, they did. And if you think about it, even when people do like, okay, Boomer, Star Trek even addressed that, if you remember the episode with the space hippies. Herbert, Herbert, Herbert. <laughs> you know, so it it's definitely touches on everything from interracial kiss to acceptance to, to everything along those lines. And you get people to see the show, and I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it how they can be fans and not to have total acceptance. Nobody ever turned around to the Bajorans and said, "Aha, uh -huh, you make fun of a hole in space. You get, you know, you get, you get, you pray to a god in a hole." You know, that's stupid. Nobody ever told the Bajorans, you're stupid to believe in something that there's no proof of, of, of gods and, and the prophets inside of a wormhole. Nobody ever turned around and, and, and did that, you know. So it, it's, it's definitely, we need to, as a, I think, as a species, just to start accepting everything. We bring so much more to the table when we're able to do that. Preach, my brother. Preach. Come on. You know, I'm is... sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, first of all, this is, uh, it, you watch previous episodes of the podcast mm -hmm. for Down the Road Show, and you already know me. You know I ain't afraid to go down any rabbit hole. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and, and that's the truth, because, you know, it's, it, it's all about, uh, uh, hmm. you know me, I talk about balance. I talk about balance of life all the time. Balance of mm -hmm. health, mind body and spirit and they're all interconnected and star trek does a good job of like you said allowing the different worlds to have their different beliefs and intermingling and accepting like in in the military i was in in the marines for a, a while and it didn't matter what religion you were when it came time to combat you know, pray, everybody pray to their own God, somebody give us favor. We don't care who, who, what name you give. Everyone's together. Everyone is, is joined together on that respect. So if you want to pray to Allah five times a day, that's great. But when shit hits the fan, you're there with us on the front line. There's no, there's no discussion. I don't want this guy fighting next to me because he's a Jew. No, there's none of that. There's none of that. We, you're all brothers under that. You have to yeah. do that. Yeah, and, and that's and, where and the world a, should be. A brotherhood under the worst of circumstances that can be yes. uh, carried out through life and gives you perspective every time you meet someone new. Yes, this is true. That's why and, I love everybody. I, and I really, once again, I, I have in person, but I will here on the podcast. Thank you for your service. Thank all of the service members and their family for our freedom and what you do for this country. I may hate political wars and going to wars, yeah. but I support our service people. Yeah, yeah, we, we do a thankless job. And, but, you know, hopefully one day we'll get to the point like it was in Starship Troopers, you know, service guarantees citizenship. Right. <laughs> we'll or, treat the vets better when we least, come out. Or at least health care for and some mental health care for the love of God. Yeah. Well, well that's, that's another rabbit hole I don't want to get down into because I could really go on forever for that. Yeah, no, I know. And you know, you know, I was, I was left driving for a month and a half, a couple of years ago. And I had the, I had the honor of picking up a few vets that mm. Lyft drivers kept canceling on because it was such a short ride that they were disabled and they couldn't get to their doctor's appointments and hearing their canceling? story. Yeah. Because it wasn't, they weren't making enough money. Oh. Yeah. Anyway. I know it's hard wrenching. Uh, I got a million stories from Lyft driving of stuff like that, but but just hearing the stories of how they're treated in these vet hospitals and what they go through after everything they've put through for this country is a travesty and a shame. And both sides of the political party and everyone out there is always like, "Oh, we need to do more," but nobody ever does, and it sucks. Mm -hmm. And and that's why voting is so important. It is. We we have to. Um... There's, there's been people, I've been lucky because I guess being a, a little bit more as, a, as an empath and everything, I've been able to deal with certain events that have happened in my past, but not everyone is so lucky. And, and we, anybody who served in the military, regardless of whether they're in the front lines or not, needs to be able to have, to know that government's going to take care of them. They shouldn't really want for anything. 
And for people to think that only people who service on the front line suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, they don't get it. You get people who are in the back line who get haunted by, um, I never did my part. And they feel convicted on that. They feel like I had people out there that died, but I was in the rear with the gear. And they go through just as much of a psychological trauma as somebody who went up front. And a lot of people just automatically assume that, well, the only way you're going to get post-traumatic stress disorder is if you were on the front lines. And that is, that's not true. No, that's not. And people, just like, just like the look, emergency, uh, emergency people in this country do, don't get mm-hmm. mental health care treatment. The cops, the EMTs, and the fire department, they don't, that does not come standard with their health care. And it should, because no, all of them, shouldn't. most of them are subject to PTSD, not just military service. Yeah, I agree. Again, you imagine showing up and every time you show up to somebody, you see humanity at its worst. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, look, this yeah. is, you know, I just lost my sister this summer. She was, yeah. she was an anesthesiologist, but she has done the EMT work and worked in the emergency rooms in Dallas, Texas in the 90s and have seen stabbings and gunshots and just the worst of the worst and the worst. And I, and she used to talk about that kind of stuff and the damage it would do to her mentally and the PTSD that she was still living with because of that and how she made so much money in private healthcare, you know, when she switched to, you know, uh, all reconstructive surgery, but still couldn't afford her own health care, let alone mental health. That shouldn't be, should never be the case. Anybody who's in a service industry like that should be taken care of for life. I'm um, sorry. I mean, you basically, when you join the service, regardless of what field you go into, you're basically writing a check and handing it to the government that the payment is anything up into including your life. And if they decide to cash that check, it's on the line. You know, it doesn't matter. You lose an arm, you lose a leg, you gave that to your country. So the least they can do is to be able to, to, to fix that for you, to do it. There's a perfect episode on, um, in Deep Space Nine about that with Aaron with him suffering the fact where he lost his leg. And that episode, if you want to understand exactly what PST is about, Aaron Eisenberg, who played Nog, and God rest his soul, did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Really, really good. And so I I behoove you, if you want to understand a little more, I think the episode was called, um, what was the name of that episode? You're going to have to look it up and do it like a footnote or something for me. I don't remember the name of the episode off the top we'll, of my head. We'll find, we'll find it and we'll include it in, in the comments below for sure. Okay, but, cool. And, but, and, and thanks for bringing that all back because, you know, that's the important of the underlying messages a lot in what goes on with Star Trek. Is, yes, it, it does. Yeah. And, and that's why entertainment can be important to help us have that connectivity because, you know, I don't, under, uh, I don't understand what you – guys have gone through what emergency you know people have gone through i got my own issues in life that are causing my Mm. own little bit of ptsd but that's you know life could do that to you Mm -hmm. and uh so so all right so what do you want to see by the end of the season of picard what what, as a hardcore fan i mean Mm. man because you know going you know we we got her coming back and we're excited for that in season two so what kind of i love what kind of build do you think they're leaning towards or personally as a fan you want to see? Well, I love the fact that, you know, Seven is back as well as you see Riker and Troy and you hear kids in the background. I really love that. I would love to see a uh, Worf as a captain of a starship somewhere along the line to come in to, to help Picard down the road. I would love, even though the chances that he may not be there, I would love to see just a flash of Q. His character was so enigma, in, in, enigma all the way through. If you bring Guinan back, Q and Guinan had some sort of a history. I would love to find out a little bit more about that. I think um, that's going to be a surprise Q drop. They're going to do it as a surprise I, I Q hope drop. so. I think they're keeping it as hush-hush as possible. I hope so, because he, his character, oh, my God. It was run, done really well. And, yeah. Uh, well, what after- do I I've been, I uh, started last year and I'm, uh, as soon as I'm caught up with Discovery, I'm going back and rewatching all of TNG. I'm on like season five mm-hmm. right now, just after the Borg and everything. Uh, but like, I forgot how quick, like the cues in episode, what, one or two? Like, boom, they start off with Q yeah. and they end with Q. So why they wouldn't bring Q back is beyond me. 
Well, Q is instrumental in the Borg becoming aware of, of Starfleet. So they, I, I would love to see that to be dovetailed in and, and kind of complete as a, as a bow. You know, so I, I love the fact, now you had people just to stay on the Star Trek vein who didn't like the J.J. films. You know, and I understood I that. I, I loved them. I, I, I had some issues, but I understood why he was doing what he did. And I didn't hate them by any stretch of imagination. It's just that I had some issues with some stuff being as a fan. But overall, I enjoyed the film. But what I did enjoy the most is that I knew that the J.J. films was going to bring more fans into the franchise. Right. And that it was going to start people back into watching Star Trek. And it, and it has. Reignited. Because of the J.J. films, that's why we have Discovery. And because Discovery did so well, that's why we got Picard. That's why we're getting the red shirts. Um, we're getting the lower decks. That's why we're getting the anime for the, for the children. That's how we're getting all of that stuff. It's, it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And now, for the first time ever, Star Trek is creating a larger buzz than Star Wars. What? <laughs> which is, okay, which is, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's make this, let's wrap this up with toxic fandom because Star Wars has some serious toxic fandom going on. Uh, you mm -hmm. get a little bit of that with the Trekkies, but not seriously as bad. However, when it comes to the term Mary Sue, that was invented by Trekkies. Yeah. So, like, uh -huh. it, it, so exactly what you brought up, like, look, the J.J. Abrams movies were there to kind of create buzz and help bring people back into the Star Trek thing. Well, I think it's a lot with the new Star Wars movies where older Star Wars generation fans hate them so much. Guess what? They weren't made for you. They're made for the kids. Kind of like when I was a kid watching the first Star Wars movies with my dad before he died in the theater and growing up watching the original Star Trek on his lap on TV. Like those kinds of That's memories. So they, were, right. they were made for us. The new yep. stuff there's going to be callbacks and fandom in there to, for us adults, but they're still not hundred percent made for us. Yep. I agree. And, and, but they got to be careful fans for both franchises got to be careful because if you throw so much hate and shade out there, directors and everybody else is like, I don't want to touch that is toxic. The director did, did uh, Han Solo. It's like, I will never direct another Star Wars movie because people get out there and they hate on it so much. You got to realize if you hate on it so much, you're basically killing the golden calf. You're going to get people who are not going to want to do it. And Disney figured that out after uh, Han Solo did, and they pulled back on everything. And now they put out The Mandalorian, which in my opinion was an awesome, awesome series that they did. Yeah, that's so just pure learning, entertainment. That's pure oh entertainment. My God. And that's what it's there for. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they, exactly. if you're overthinking the Mandalorian, you're just wait. You're overthinking. <laughs> you know, like that would be funny. <laughs> People overthinking and applying things that's not even there. Well, you know, Baby Yoda is actually the birth of the new generation of kids growing up with their wide-eyed innocence and having power. <laughs> you no, know? no, he's a marketing scheme to sell <laughs> toys and merchandise for Disney. Damn it. <laughs> everybody has a little in there just like people don't like to hear it Roddenberry wrote words to the theme to Star Trek did you know that I don't ever want to read them that he wrote a lyrics to the Star Trek theme because he felt that if Dear he God, made money, no. he wanted a piece of it I mean people that's forget that's smart they, they, he, yeah those people thought that he was also financially motivated the IDIC symbol he actually designed that so he could sell merchandising yeah. Well, you know, I mean, so there's there's stuff on that. You, yeah. you got to. And George Lucas started it all with the merchandising. And every oh, creator yeah. out there now goes down the same vein. So as you're uh, signing your NDAs and you're signing away portions of your intellectual properties, merchandising is now in the back of everybody's mind. Well, just like uh, uh, what you call Mel Brooks said, I will in, in Spaceballs, I will show you the most powerful force in the universe. What, the Swartz? No, merchandising. Yep, 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 yep. Classic, <laughs> classic, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, okay, well, then, besides Star Trek, is there anything else you're watching or reading that you're just completely nerding out on? Uh, uh, let me see. Well, there's the Disney thing um, I've been watching. Oh, my God, you, you pulled me to the carpet on this. There's stuff that I do watch on a regular basis, but I, I'm blanking on. 
and we were because, and we were doing so well. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm blanking on, but that's the oh <laughs> son of a biscuit. There's something else that I, I'm watching on a regular basis, and I can't recall what it is. The Witcher, Outlander, Brazen oh, yeah, Anatomy. Well, oh, see, that's why I I forget because I finished The Witcher in like two sittings. <laughs> oh man, you just fly through that. Are you going to go back and rewatch it? Yeah, probably will. Because uh, yeah. I, I, because that's done. Also, I thought it's done well. I, I like The Witcher. Netflix has been doing a great job. Oh, The Expanse. If you want some real intelligence, I'm okay. I'm in season. I'm in. Expanse. I'm in season one of The Expanse. So be careful. Don't spoil yeah. anything for me. You can spoil it's anything really, for my listeners, just not me. <laughs> it's really intelligent sci-fi. I haven't seen intelligent sci-fi like that. In, in the longest. I mean, they do have action and everything, but you you got to pay attention to the little things that's going on and to try to figure it out. They do such a great, great job. Yeah, so it reminds me of series. it reminds me of a good like World War II spy movie in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. And if you want something that's really kind of blows your mind a little bit, um, it's interesting about the concepts of a multiverse is a man in a high castle. Oh, okay. Uh, a number of people I know have watched that, and that's actually on my list of things to watch, because you know me in Multiverse and all of that. Yep. It, we have those conversations off the camera all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know my crazy theories. Anyway. Yeah, I do. All right. Well, uh, everybody, go follow Nathan Adams personally at his social media. Where can they can do that? I'm Sergeant Blade on Instagram. Um, you can find me. I don't have a public page on Facebook, but um, out there is Nathan Adams on on Facebook, and Twitter is also Sergeant Blade. So those are my my accounts there. So feel free and uh, Starfleet Underground on Instagram, Starfleet Underground, all one word, on on um, SoundCloud. And if you want to get a hold of us, it's the Collective, one word, at Starfleet Underground dot com you can send us email right there as well and who knows maybe we we'll even read your questions on the air uh we got another one dropping on monday so we got to get you on as a guest is that every monday uh yep every monday you can find us we got a team of of uh we got heather we have fred we have rocky and myself and we have guests that rotate in and out so we need to get you as a guest one day Awesome. So look for that and more by my friends here. Follow all the links in the comments. And brother, I miss you so much now that I'm in Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, big magical air hug, virtual hug to you. Ah. And uh, I can't wait to, you know, get healthier and get back out to California. So that way uh, I can see you in person. And uh, I'll see you somewhere down the road. Okay. I'll see you down the road too. Remember, just don't have a great week. Make it so. Well, thank you very much for stopping in at Down the Road Show, especially all you Trekkies out there. Uh, I love Trekkies. You guys are so smart. It is such a great cerebral show. And uh, some of you may disagree with some of the canon, and some of you may love all of the canon. I I'm just a fan of entertainment, and I love it all. So I look forward to talking more with some other Trekkies out there and some other friends and having them on the show and definitely talking more about Star Trek and Picard because I'm really loving the way this show is going so far. So thanks for stopping in and we'll see you down the road.